memory. Is there anything more central to making us who we are? Is there anything more powerful than reliving a life-changing moment in your mind? Is there anything more horrific than slowly losing one's family member to Alzheimer's or dementia? Now, one of my own oldest and clearest memories was the time that I asked my mom why the sky was blue. Now, this was a common occurrence. I was a naturally curious kid constantly asking questions about the world. And my mom, a high school and English drama teacher, would often make up stories if she didn't know the answer. And in this case, it was something about fairies. And even at five years old, I clearly remember saying, no, mom, that's crap. <laughs> so one could say that I was a born scientist shaped equally by curiosity and skepticism. To the time that I stopped believing in Santa Claus and tried to convince my younger brother using logic that it would take too long to deliver hundreds of millions of uh, presents to, in a day. To another time where I asked the, my mom's doctor whether I could uh, watch the birth of my brother, much to their horror. <laughs> Fast forward 30 years, I'm still asking questions, but now I get to fill in the blanks. My own research lab is tackling some of the most complex questions we know how our memory is encoded and stored in the brain. And in particular, we're studying the molecular and cellular mechanisms in those brain cells that encode, store, and retrieve memories. And, so, and we recently made a surprising discovery that we may have viruses to thank for our own cognition and ability to learn. Now, the normal response to the word virus is fear and dread. Viruses are the bond villains of nature and have evolved to hijack our own cells' machinery. And retroviruses, like HIV, are especially cunning because they attack our main defense mechanism against viruses, the immune cell. And they first do this by inserting their, their own genomic material into the cell, and then that instruction manual tells the cell to make viral proteins instead of its own. So the virus gets the cell to do its own dirty work. And eventually, the, the cell makes viral particles that contain a viral capsid surrounded by a membrane. And this viral capsid is a beautiful protein structure or shell that protects the viral genome from the host cell's defense. So essentially, viruses and retroviruses copy and paste themselves into the host genome. And our own DNA is, in fact, riddled with these viral elements. Almost half our own genome is of viral origin. All genes are made up of sequences of DNA that code in our cells. But all cells have the same DNA, the same set of DNA. So how, how does a blood cell differ from a liver cell? Well, each cell type only encodes a specific set of genes and that get turned on only in that specific cell type. And this occurs first through DNA and transcription of DNA to RNA and translation of RNA to protein. And these proteins perform a variety of functions in the cell, from the cell structure to enzymes that catalyze biological activity. But in all of this remains a mystery. How do cells store information at the molecular level, despite the fact that these proteins have short lives hours to days? And in particular, how are memories stored in the physical brain for up to a lifetime? Pursuing this understanding can't be overstated. A brain contains billions of cells and trillions of connections or synapses. And each one of those synapses is a tiny, exquisite structure that contains thousands of proteins. And we also know that a whole new gene program gets turned on when you learn, leading to protein synthesis that turns experiences into physical changes in the brain. So the structure of your brain is literally changing as you learn. But neurons have a unique problem in that those synapses are far away from the cell body where the proteins are made. So the basic anatomy of a neuron is a cell body, many dendrites, one long axon connected by synapses. So one can think of these axons and dendrites as highways between cities. And the cars on these highways are electrical signals or action potentials that flow down from the dendrite through the cell body all the way down to the synapse and across to other neurons. So in 1949, the psychologist Donald Hebb 
proposed a theoretical model of how memories in the, in the brain can be stored. And he, he suggested that a specific set of neurons could be incorporated into a specific circuit that encodes that memory. And the way this works is through synaptic plasticity, where specific synapses are strengthened or weakened during learning. So those synapses are dynamically changing while you learn, but how does this happen? At the center of this is a gene called ARC, which I've been studying most of my career. And the expression of ARC is so finely tuned by experience that scientists have used it to mark which neurons are active during a particular memory. And even more interesting, the RNA of ARC traffics to those dendrites where it gets rapidly made into protein at synapses. So to me, this suggested that ARC must play an important role in memory encoding. And indeed, if you take out the ARC gene from mice, they look normal, they behave normally, but they just can't remember anything. So this one gene is essential for one of the most basic functions of the brain, memory. So when I started my own research lab, I wanted to understand the biochemistry of ARC protein. And to do this, we used a common bacteria, E. coli, to make a lot of protein that we could study. But when we started to do this, we saw some weird results. The protein seemed to be way larger than it should be. So we almost gave up on this line of experiments, but we thought, why don't we look at the protein and just see if that could give us a clue on why it's so much bigger. And when we did this, this is what we saw. Large stereotype structures that had the soccer ball shape that looked like a viral capsid. Now, unlike movies, it's very rare that in a science career you have the eureka moment. And when I saw these images, I had goosebumps. Why would a neuronal gene form something that looks like a virus? Our structural experiments showed that ARC looks like the HIV capsid. And since structure usually informs function, this one observation led to a series of studies looking at whether ARC can actually act like a virus. And as I mentioned earlier, the viral capsid is essential for transferring its own gen genome from cell to cell. And we found that ARC capsids contain RNA that encode its own protein, and that ARC is released from neurons in the capsid surrounded by a membrane, just like a virus, and it can share its own genomic material from cell to cell. So we think we've discovered a completely new way of cellular communication. But where did the ARC gene come from? So we know that it's highly conserved between humans and birds, but surprisingly, there's no fish gene. And the closest DNA sequence in fish is act actually an active retrotransposon, which is a DNA sequence that's viral-like in nature and that is ancestral to the retroviruses. So we think that ARC gene came from an ancient viral infection or retrotransposon insertion over 400 million years ago in an ancestor. And maybe this chance event led to the evolution of brains that allowed land animals to adapt to every niche on Earth. But there's one more, uh, one more thing that's, more, that's puzzling about ARC. The, there's also a fly gene. And so our analysis showed that actually the fly gene was repurposed and evolved from a different retrotransposon. But the fly protein, the ARC protein, can still form a capsid and has similar biology to the mammalian gene. So we think evolution struck twice, and so this biology must be important. But like any paradigm shift in science, we're now left with more questions than answers. Why would you need a viral-like mechanism in your brain? What else is ARC transferring cell to cell, and what happens to those cells that are infected? And why would you need this for memory storage in the first place? So while we don't have the answers yet, there are some immediate implications. We know that ARC's only made in the cells that are incorporated into that specific circuit that encodes the memory. And maybe when ARC is released, it tells the other neighboring cells not to be incorporated into that memory so they can be saved for later memories. And we also think that this pathway is critical for Alzheimer's disease and other neurological dis disorders. Most neurodegenerative disorders result from toxic accumulation of proteins inside the cell. But, they don't, but these cells don't die immediately because there are mechanisms to eliminate the toxic protein from out of the cell. And one of these ways is through these membrane-bound vesicles 
that can remove the toxic protein to the, to the garbage disposal cell of the brain called the microglia. And these vesicles look just like the ARC vesicles. We also know that if you take out the ARC gene from mice that were genetically engineered to mimic Alzheimer's disease, you actually reduce pathology. So we think this viral-like properties of ARC are actually required or a part of the spread of pathology during Alzheimer's. Now, you've also probably heard about the recent advances in genetic editing. And one of these, called CRISPR, has allowed us to efficiently alter any DNA sequence in a genome, including humans. But what you may not know is that CRISPR is actually the bacterial immune defense mechanism against viruses. So yet again, we have viruses to thank for, for a, a protein that we can take advantage of. But there's one big problem with CRISPR, and that it's very difficult to get CRISPR into human cells. And the only way we can do this right now is to use modified viruses that can get the CRISPR DNA into a human. But those modified viruses still elicit an immune response. But we know that ARC is normally made in the cell, and so maybe we can use ARC capses to deliver CRISPR and other DNA without eliciting an immune response. So we think this is just the beginning of the story. There are hundreds of other genes that contain viral-like sequences that are similar to ARC. Maybe these genes also encode capsids or other proteins that have similar properties that we could take advantage of. So it turns out that these Bond villains of nature were only masquerading as bad guys, and in fact, were double agents all along. And it's fascinating to think that some of the most complex processes in the brain may have been the result of an ancient viral infection. Thank you. <laughs>